Good afternoon and welcome to the webinar. I'm Mark Nason. I'm a council member of the British Society of Soil Science and I'm delighted to welcome you to what is the fourth webinar that we've hosted this year. Before I welcome our panellists, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the British Society of Soil Science as hosts of today's webinar. So we are an established international membership organisation and we're a charity committed to the study of soil in its widest aspects. We bring together those working in academia and we also have a growing membership amongst practitioners who are implementing soil science in industry and anybody with a keen interest in soils. We'll be hosting nine webinars during 2023, so please do keep an eye on our website for further details. Um, and before we begin, just some basic housekeeping. As there are so many of you here today, all your microphones have been muted. We'll be taking questions at the end of both presentations and we'll be monitoring those throughout the webinar. So if you have a good idea for a question, please could you try to submit that by 12.50 as that will allow us to get through as many of them as we can. Although there is a raise your hand button, we won't be using that unless a presenter specifically asks to see a show of hands. Today's presentation has been awarded BASIS and ENROSO CPD points. If you're registered with either of those bodies, then please contact us directly after the event to find out how to claim those points. And finally, please be aware that we are recording today's presentation. So it's now my pleasure to introduce our first presenter, Professor Tom Crowther. Tom is an ecologist and a professor in the Department of Environmental Systems Science at ETH Zurich. He began his professorship in 2017, where he started the Crowther Lab, an interdisciplinary group of scientists exploring how global scale ecological systems interact to regulate the climate and collecting data to inform best practices for ecosystem specific restoration efforts. His research focuses on soil biodiversity at a global scale and its links with plant productivity, carbon storage and climate. The goal of this research is to generate a scientific understanding of ecological systems to facilitate the conservation and restoration of nature at scale across the globe. Tom is also the founder of Restore, a science-based open data platform that provides ecological insights, transparency and connectivity to many conservation and restoration efforts around the world. He serves as chair of the advisory board of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration and Tom is chief scientific advisor to the UN's Trillion Trees campaign. So we're delighted to welcome Tom over to you. Nice one. Um, so yeah, as we were saying, we, I, we work on sort of ecosystem ecology and the restoration of ecosystems, but my own personal background is actually in soil biodiversity and soil biochemistry. And so it's uh, quite exciting to be giving a sort of presentation on the foundational role of microbes in, in what we do. And I apologize if I'm going to, I've only got 20 minutes, I'm going to rattle through a lot of stuff, but I was very excited to to uh, get a lot of this stuff out there. So, uh, uh, you know, I'm excited to show a lot of the, the different angles in which we're, we're, we're addressing this topic. Um, so, yeah, ultimately, like everyone here, I'm fascinated by soil biodiversity because of the inherent beauty and magic of these below ground worlds, but also because of their ability to facilitate the functioning of ecosystems and the supporting of all life above ground uh, as well as below ground. And it's that uh, capacity to facilitate the, the conservation and recovery of, of life on earth that, that really makes these ecosystems functionally important. And so in the last few years, as Mark mentioned, we've been working with this organization called Restore, which is focused on regenerating and revitalizing ecosystems all across the planet. And right now, Restore works with about 150,000 local projects who are doing conservation or restoration, little community projects or back garden projects or rewilding efforts to try to make sure they have access to the scientific data that the academic community has uh, at its disposal, but also to try and connect up that movement so it becomes a sort of functioning system. Um, and so if we go on to Restore, if you were to like go to the website now, you could see all those hundreds of thousands of projects around the world. And what, what's sort of striking about these projects is how they're all seeking one particular thing. Ultimately, they are all searching to find a solution that makes 
healthy biodiversity the economic choice for local people and so a beautiful example is one of my favorites in Ethiopia if you zoom into into the cafe region of Ethiopia you see Desta's coffee jungle this is a um, it's essentially a it's a farm it's an agroforestry system growing coffee but they they build this coffee production out of a deep understanding of ecosystems so if you actually went onto the site and you zoomed into that region you can see the massive agricultural footprint of coffee production in the region but as you zoom closer into Desta's farm you'll see actually that you see no signal of that agricultural footprint and that's because instead of removing the forest to restore uh, to grow coffee what they do is they protect a forest and they allow those native coffee trees to grow underneath the canopy and because that ecosystem traps water and nutrients those those uh, coffee plants grow really really well without the need for fertilizers and irrigation which is so desperately needed in the surrounding community and so what they're doing is they're working with nature to build that economic sustainability and in Restore, Desta gets access to ecological insights about which species grow well in those regions and the, the climate conditions and soil types. They also get free ecological monitoring to show how carbon dynamics are changing in their site over time. But most importantly, Desta gets connectivity. So now when he sells his coffee, the customers, you or I or anybody else, would be able to see where that coffee comes from. And you can see that by buying that coffee, you're having a positive environmental footprint rather than a negative environmental footprint. And that has led to really tangible gains in his uh, increases in his coffee um, in, in the sort of uh, profitability of his, of his organization. And because of that, both Desta and his farm have, uh, are, are really thriving. And as a result, because the healthier his nature gets, the more money he gets, now the surrounding farmers in the surrounding community are all starting to follow his lead and trying to figure out ways in allowing nature to recover on their lands so that they can have more sustainable agricultural production. And that is the key ultimately to what restoration of, of nature is. It's about finding those solutions that make nature the economic choice. And that is what we are seeing all over this restore movement, hundreds of thousands of sites. Examples include this, um, this community in Mexico that are protecting a beautiful ancient tropical forest uh, and they gain revenue through the ecotourism that is dependent on the healthy mixture of species that, that lives there. Or my favorite example is a guy called Samuel Kimwindu, Kamwendo from, um, uh, from um, Kenya, where he actually to avoid honey badgers, he puts his honey, his beehives up in trees and he's got the saying, no trees, no bees, no honey, no money, which is a beautiful example of how nature becomes the economic choice and then you cannot stop it from thriving across landscapes. That is what the Restore platform is built for and that's what we want to hopefully share as much of the ecological knowledge that exists within communities like this to those practitioners. But in return, those practitioners give us a wealth of information. And that information includes where they are, what they're doing, and what they're learning from restoration initiatives around the world. And one of the first ways we actually, actually used that information was in a teaching class that I had a year and a half ago, where we essentially, all I did is ask all my students in the class to reach out to as many projects as possible on the Restore profile and ask them, what are they doing? And what they found is that the, most of the practices were spread across these 10 um, these 10 kinds of initiatives, ranging from natural regeneration to the conservation or protection of vegetation, soil amendments, microbes, and animals. And what, that, what they also asked them to do is, cl is classify whether they found that practice to be a success relative to the way the ecosystem was before, or if it was a failure, and to try to quantify how ecosystem regeneration has happened uh, as, a, as a result. And what Obviously, I want to stress that this is just a teaching class. This isn't a, a peer-reviewed publication, but the insights from that class were so fascinating, and they've really given us some of the food for thought, which is spurring on some of our research that I'll touch on now. But ultimately, you can see the, some of the results of that class, that that um, that sort of class project. Of course, in most pro in most systems, different the uh, sort of each intervention type had many successes and many uh, many failures a classic example is natural regeneration where in the majority of cases across the restore site natural regeneration worked really really well and it promoted the health of those ecosystems but in some areas where there was a lot of invasive species or a lot of soil degradation you don't see positive increases and it's in those places where possible like soil amendments or microbiome amendments and vegetation can be a really useful thing and this is what we saw across every single uh, intervention type, except one, 
astonish, astonishingly, the, the students suggested that there was, found that there was no examples that we could find across the Restore website where natural microbiome inoculations didn't have either a neutral or a positive impact on the regeneration of those ecosystems. There were no examples where it slowed things down or made or, or slowed down the like reduced the likelihood of success. And that was really fascinating to us. Now it's worth it's worth throwing out the caveat that even though there's thousands and thousands of projects on Restore, this data all comes from 12 examples. So it's an N of 12. We're not talking about big data and confident reporting yet. But it's useful insights to suggest that this might be a healthy way of, of sort of stimulating the regeneration of ecosystems. And it's something I'm going to focus on for the, for the rest of this speech. But before I get to that, I'm going to sort of start at the big picture and the, the sort of the, take a little bit of a step back. Because ultimately, in order for us to understand what microbiome inoculations might do, we have to fundamentally understand whether microbes, whether the, the organisms existing in the soil can confer different functional capacities to different ecosystems. And this, we got onto this topic because we were trying to understand the role of microbes in governing earth system dynamics and carbon storage across the planet and how this might feed back to the climate system. You know, this, is, this shows a model of the, the distribution of soil carbon, well, plant and soil carbon from the South Pole all the way up to the North Pole, where you see this huge bomb of soil carbon in the high latitude parts of the world, which is uh, essentially being trapped there because of long term cold climate conditions that happen at winter. And what the concern is, is that as we warm these high latitude regions, this is where we're going to see the increased microbial activity that releases that carbon into the atmosphere, stimulating the rate of climate change. And when we explored this at a global scale, what we see is, yes, the highest amounts of soil carbon exist in the high latitudes. And this is also coupled with the highest rates of atmospheric warming, suggesting that these high latitude regions are a particularly vulnerable region in terms of this potential for a positive climate, uh, carbon cycle climate feedback. Because increasing the metabolic activity of these microbes in high latitudes stimulates the losses of carbon into the atmosphere. We also found that wherever we protect the healthy, um, the integrity of healthy uh, invertebrate communities, that can actually dampen some of that, that positive feedback, slowing those losses of carbon into the atmosphere. But I found this really both exciting at the time, but also very unsatisfying because we're making these projections out of information about the climate and the soil carbon and the physics and the chemistry of the, of the environment but we have literally no information about the functional capacity of the organisms that are actually driving those, those processes. And so in order for us to really constrain our understanding of the scale of this potential feedback, ultimately we need to know what role microbial communities have in conferring functions or, or carbon the influencing carbon dynamics in different parts of the globe. We know that changes in temperature and moisture and vegetation types influence carbon storage, but what is the role of the microbial community? And to get at this, you know, it's a really difficult challenge because we don't have fully comprehensive maps of microbial communities yet. And so how do we insert this microbial biogeographic information into our understanding of Earth system dynamics? And so this is where we started getting into the functional biogeography of soil microbes. And what we started by doing is following the approaches that we see in the above ground world, where essentially we've broken the world up into different plant functional types. And by doing that, we can build models that function differently in the different ecosystem types based on the vegetation that exists there. So we spent a lot of time doing that for arbuscular and ectomycorrhizal fungi, breaking up the mycorrhizal uh, um, component of the microbiome into the major functional types. And Brian Stedinger published this paper a few years ago showing that forests are dominated by the ectomycorrhizal fungi in the high latitudes and arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi in the low latitudes. And what was interesting is that he found evidence for these really clear tipping points where you get 100% ectomycorrhizal fungi, fungal dominated systems switching very rapidly to 100% arbuscular mycorrhizal systems. And that suggested the potential for feedbacks where microbial communities are shaping the ecosystem to favor their own conspecific mycorrhizal type. So it gives some indication that these microbes really are shaping their ecosystem types. Since then, Gabriel Smith has been continuing this research and his, pa his paper's coming out very soon. Um, essentially breaking the world into more and more and more functional types, uh, bringing in the variation in uh, gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria and across fungal and bacterial 
um, uh, groupings, ultimately he's able to break the world into the major different functional types that can really help us to explain the variation in enzyme activity that is ultimately underpinning these changes in carbon dynamics across the globe. So that's very exciting stuff. And this kind of information is all really useful. Uh, Joe Wan in our group has been uh, using this kind of information to build better Earth system models. If every pixel, you can represent the microbes that are driving carbon dynamics in each one of those pixels, you can better constrain our understanding of how the carbon dynamics are working. But, and what he keeps coming back to, and what we all keep coming back to, is unlike the above ground world, the variation in microbial communities within one region, and within one functional type, can often be as much if not greater than the variation between functional types. And that's because microbial communities are unique in their immense diversity. The trait variation within individual clades of, microbi of, of microbial types can be absolutely immense. And that means just mapping the functional types doesn't capture most of that variation. So what we've been doing is exploring the variation in microbial traits that underpin the decomposition uh, by, of organic material by microbes, and also their ability to influence the productivity of plants. These two key ecosystem functions govern the amount of carbon being released by ecosystems and drawn in by ecosystems, which mean they determine the, the turnover of carbon across the globe. So for the next few slides, I'll focus on these two parallel research lines. The decomposition side, trying to understand how the traits of microbes influence decomposition and productivity of plants. So on the decomposition side, we've been working with a large network of fungi collected, wood decomposer fungi collected from all across North America. And what we do is we grow those fungi in petri dishes. We allow them to fight against one another. We measure their growth rates, their uh, enzyme production, uh, their volatile compa compound production, all sorts of char char chemical and biophysical traits that they express while they grow and compete. And by throwing all of those traits into a principal component analysis, we can start to see the trade-offs in trait expression that help us to explain the, the variation in decomposition that, that takes place across these fungi. And what we see is on this particular graph, we see a very clear trade-off between fast-growing fungi on the left and slow-growing fungi on the right. The slow-growing individuals are very good at tolerating cold and dry conditions, but that comes at the, ex at the expense of rapid growth, whereas the fast-growing individuals are highly competitive for nice, they, they, they thrive in optimal warm, moist conditions, but they cannot survive in harsh conditions. And their increased metabolic activity means that those fungi on the right are the ones that correlate really well with decomposition rates. The, the, the highly metabolically active fungi are the ones that are decomposing wood at a really rapid speed. Now, similarly on the productivity side, we've also been using a large network of fungal systems collected from across Europe this time. But this isn't individual fungi, this is a collection of uh, entire microbial communities where we've been using functional gene assays to explore the functional genes, uh, the genetic expression of these genes that are expressed by these fungal communities across the region. And what's exciting is once again, we can combine all this information into a simple principal component analysis, once again, showing the trade-offs in trait expression across all of these fungal communities, where on the, on the right-hand side, we see the microbial communities that are promoting the, the uh, the decomposition and breakdown of and the processing of carbon rich compounds, whereas on the left hand side, it's the processing of nitrogen rich compounds, which are the ones that are most important for facilitating tree growth. And because of this trade off, we can now start to see which types of traits facilitate tree growth more than more than others. And that means with these functional trait trade-offs, we can start to understand how we can predict the variation in decomposition and productivity across our fungal systems. In both cases, we were able to explain around 30% of the variation in communities when we explored these effects in the real world. So we could see that communities dominated by certain types of fungi are very conservative and slow growing, and they slow down decomposition, leading to a long-term carbon storage. Whereas some of the other species, like the Morelia species, were much more rapid and fast growing, and they facilitated active and rapid decomposition. Similarly, on the mycorrhizal side, certain species were more conservative around their nutrients, while others really facilitated the breakdown of organic nitrogen and uh, facilitated the growth of, of uh, or the rapid acceleration of plant growth uh, when those microbial communities are there. 
And so with all this information, because we can correlate the, the presence of these traits with individual climate conditions, or all the climate conditions that exist across those study regions, we can now map those functional traits. And because those traits correlate with the characteristics that, that we're interested in, we can now get this fundamental understanding of the variation in microbial traits, which we could insert back into those models to compare against the impact of uh, climate and temperature and soil moisture and pH and all of the other things that we know also drive ecosystem functioning. And it's amazing to see that we can explain up to, you know, we can often explain more of the variation with these microbial characteristics than we can with any of the climate or above ground characteristics of the ecosystems. So this is an ongoing research line that we're continuing to develop to, to uh, increase this understanding of the functional biogeography of these soil communities. But the relevance is obvious. Ultimately, what we can say, what we say, can say quite clearly is that even though this community in Patagonia has a very similar climate conditions and similar similar um, geological conditions than this location here in northern Scotland, differences in uh, the environmental conditions that drove functional differences in the microbial communities also confer really strong differences in the ability of those ecosystems to capture and store carbon in the long term. And understanding those differences in microbial communities is going to be critical if we're going to be conserving ecosystems to promote carbon storage across the planet. But it's also obviously critical if we're going to be restoring those ecosystems to have the, mo the, the best functionality. So when we go back to all of those thousands of projects on Restore, we see that many of them are using these different approaches and some of them are using microbiome transplants. So what will happen traditionally is that when you're trying to restore this, um, this, this former uh, pasture land or this, this former grassland uh, back into its natural forest type, what people tend to do is they, they add the plants uh, from the forest into the grassland. But in, in, in this case, we know very clearly that there is a fundamentally different microbial community in the forest as there is in the adjacent ecosystem. And so what these studies are starting to do is rather than just adding the plants, they actually add the microbiome in advance of the plants. And when you introduce the microbiome first, that can influence the way the plants can regenerate when we're trying to do restoration. And so Colin Avril in our group has been really trying to explore this across the globe to see was the observation from the from that teaching class a standardized observation that we see across many academic publications now this is a very complicated looking graph but actually it's the simplest answer ever any any point to the right hand side of this graph shows that the mic introducing the microbiome increased plant regeneration whereas anything to the left hand side was a reduction in plant regeneration and what you can clearly see is that on average, there was a clear trend towards increasing the regeneration rates of that vegetation when the microbiome was introduced. And in fact, there was a 64% increase in the rate of maturity of those ecosystems towards a climax system, which is absolutely astonishing. But there's obviously a huge amount of variation that you can see as well. Many sites had very minimal changes, whereas some sites had up to 700, 800% increases in regeneration rates when the microbiome is there. And what we tend to see is that those are associated with the more arid and harsh soil, climate, soil environmental conditions. When you have very arid soils, that is when they need the microbiome all the more to be able to facilitate regeneration. So this has been the basis for a lot of the a lot of the ongoing work that we're doing to trying to facilitate these restoration projects and it's uh, Colin actually himself launched an organization called Funga that is working with restoration projects to try and improve microbial diversity so that they can facilitate plant regeneration but this insight that it was the more degraded and arid sites that had the biggest effects was the basis for some of the experimental work that we've got ongoing where we're actually trying to study different uh, regeneration rates in different parts of the world. So um, this is a, a particular region in a few years ago, Lawrence Porter and their group showed that there's huge variation in regeneration rates of forests across uh, Central and South America. You see some regions in green will regenerate very well on their own with natural regeneration, but some of the areas in orange and red really struggle without, they, there's, there's some limiting factor that's preventing them, those ecosystems from recovering. And so we've been setting up a range of experiments in the Yucatan Peninsula, which has a range of, uh, of locations where natural regeneration progresses very well and other ecosystems where they really seem to need human inter intervention to facilitate that plant recovery. And so what we tried to do is to explore, is it, is it the microbiome? Is it those microbiome introductions that is the limiting factor in governing restoration success? 
And so Felix has been setting up this enormous restoration experiment across, uh, across a region, which ranges from some of the harshest soils uh, on the, on the right-hand side of this graph to some of the most lush soils in the, in the region, which is on the left-hand side. And so all he's been doing is introducing you know, thousands and thousands of trees, but in association with those trees, he either adds a healthy microbiome from a nearby forest, or he allows them to, to just regenerate naturally using the microbiome that's currently in that degraded pasture land. And so what his results are gonna suggest, well, well, I can show you the trend that, that the impact of that restoration or the impact of that, uh, those, those different treatments will be indicated on this graph across a gradient of soil quality. So on the left-hand side are the very rich soils and on the right-hand side are the very harsh soils. And this is measured in terms of the, um, the, the initial mortality rates of the vegetation across that gradient. And so what we see very clearly is that with, in the absence of, of those microbial inoculations, we do see this very clear drop off in the regeneration rates of those ecosystems in the harsh conditions. However, when the microbiome was introduced with those plants, that is when we see really consistent regeneration across both the, the, the good and the poor soil quality regions. And that is really exciting in, indication that it is often the microbiome that can over, help, my, help the vegetation to overcome some of those limiting steps in the recovery process. So that was really exciting news, which we then spread back to those practitioners around the world on Restore. And some of those practitioners like Desta got really excited about this and suggested that they are going to start implementing microbiome regeneration to try and facilitate the recovery of their ecosystems. And what we, this made us realize is that actually there's a whole range of people that might be open to doing experiments just like this around the world. And when we put out a call to the sites on Restore, we, we had around a two, over 200 projects that actually gave us positive responses saying that they would be happy to trial out a microbiome introduction to see if that facilitates the regeneration in those areas. Now, this is only after about four or five months of regrowth. And so I'm gonna give you the most very preliminary and premature uh, evidence. But at this very moment in time, whilst what, uh, at the, the point of remeasuring, what they've done is they've introduced, again, vegetation with and without the healthy soil microbiome. And what we see is that in some of the harsh tropical regions, the, the regions that have the, some of the more arid conditions, that's where we see a really big influence of the microbiome introduction. Whereas in the high latitudes, where there's rich, healthy soils, those are the places where the microbiome introduction doesn't seem to be having such a big effect. Now, this is very preliminary and it's completely uh, obscured by variations in, in seasonal and temporal variation. We, we're gonna need many years of research to be able to confirm these, these trends, but it's a sort of example about how we can use these networks like this. And I'd encourage any scientists out there to try to use this restore network as a massive potential to facilitate uh, active and um, sort of um, what's the word? applied research initiatives that can happen across the globe, hopefully to facilitate the restoration and the economic security of, of local communities across the planet. Tom, so that is, is absolutely fantastic. Um, I'm going to have to do my role as, as chair now and, uh, and bring it to a close so that we have time for, for Lisa and for questions. Um, yeah, amazing work, yeah, really, really interesting. We've got some really good questions coming in on the chat box. Um, which is almost annoying because I've got lots of questions that I'd quite like to answer myself, but <laughs> I'll probably have to give priority to our guests. Um, so thank you very much. And just a reminder to everyone on the call that we'll be taking questions for both speakers at the end of the session. Um, so our next speaker is Dr. Lisa Cole. Uh, Lisa is a member of the British Society of Soil Science, and she is a research fellow at the University of Aberdeen through the Daphne Jackson Fellowship. And the Daphne Jackson Trust is a UK charity that works to help people who have taken a, a career break of more than two years return to research by assisting them with securing funding along with mentoring and retraining. So Lisa is into the second year of her fellowship now, and she's happy to be contacted by anyone who would like to know more about the work of the Trust. Lisa is a soil ecologist interested in how global change impacts soil biodiversity and ecosystem function. Her current research is examining how land use influences the soil microbiome and the consequences of that for nutrient cycling, in particular the soil carbon response. Her aim is to understand how management practices can improve soil health 
to establish a microbial community dominated by physiological traits that increase carbon storage. Lisa will be talking about microbial mechanisms in climate soil feedbacks and how microbes can help us incorporate more carbon into soils as stable forms of soil organic matter. She'll also describe some ongoing lab work addressing whether soil management alters soil properties to the benefit of certain microbes that will improve its function or whether microbes can be introduced to improve the soil's ability to store more carbon. Um, so thank you very much and over to you Lisa. Thanks Mark, thanks for that introduction and um, for inviting me to talk today. So I'm going to be following on Tom's really interesting talk um, to talk a bit more about um, the functionality of soil microbes and this is about microbes building carbon um, in soils. And can you all see my full slides? I'm presuming so. Okay. So um, the UK government state of the environment report was published in January this year and its main findings were that intensive soil um, agriculture has caused arable soils to lose almost half of their carbon and that soil degradations calculated to cost 1.2 billion in the UK every year and that was calculated in 2010 so it's likely to um, far exceed that now. This means that um, the soils and the services that are providing for us are under threat. And in view of this, soils are being offered more protection and are under discussion much more by policymakers. So the 25 year environment plan states that England soils must be managed sustainably by 2030 and that steps must be taken towards restoring the UK soils. So it's vital that soils are on the agenda now and that we increase our knowledge on how we go about achieving this. So what is healthy soil? And this is a huge question and it's under debate and it very much depends upon who you ask and what they're expecting from their soils. But a definition has been provided and this is from Lehman and it's that soil health, the continued capacity of soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals and humans and connects agriculture and soil science to policy, stakeholder needs and sustainable supply chain management. So historically, when we think about soil services, we tend to focus on um, crop production, but today we can also think about the other roles that soils can play for, um, for us in terms of how they affect water quality and um, how their role in climate change mitigation and also for human health overall. And the one uniting, the one uniting feature that most folk um, seem to agree on here is that organic matter in soils is crucial to underpin soil's physical and chemical properties. And this provides a really good habitat for a, a diverse array of soil microbes and animals. So if we now look at global carbon stores, there's um, 700 gigatons of carbon in the atmosphere and a similar amount in vegetation. So overall though, we can see that soils contain by far the largest store, which is 1700 gigatons and that's billions of tons of carbon. So that's a massive amount. So if you think of any small shifts um, in this due to land use change, then this can have a massive um, impact on global carbon balance. So it's been estimated that since uh, man started um, undertaking agricultural activities thousands of years ago, that soils have lost 133 gigatons of carbon. And this is equivalent to the amount of carbon that's been lost um, due to deforestation. So because agricultural soils have lost so much carbon, these degraded soils represent an opportunity to return some of that carbon below ground. And this could sequester, estimates have been um, banded around, but they, they're estimating that you could sequester over a billion additional tons of carbon every year if we change how we manage our agricultural soils. And as croplands occupy about a third of the Earth's land, this is a major target for soil-based carbon sequestration and the emerging philosophy of regenerative agriculture that's gaining popularity and provides benefit both for the soils but for the farmers also. So soil microbes are central in this. Um, they are the gatekeepers for soil atmosphere carbon exchange and they determine the fate of any photosynthetically fixed carbon that enters the soil with carbon loss or storage being dependent on the activity of the soil microbes. 
or more specifically, the efficiency with which they use that carbon. So as these carbohydrates enter the soil, and this can be from plant litter or through root exudates, it's used as an energy source by the microbes, and they incorporate this carbon into their, microbi into their biomass when they're growing. On the other hand, if they live in a more stressed, um, a more stressful habitat or a degraded soil, then they're going to have to use a lot of that energy to maintain their metabolic processes. And a lot of this carbon will become lost from soil because then they tend to respire more. And this is released from soils as carbon dioxide. And these sort of stress factors can be a lack of food or it could be something like drought. And the balance between these two processes of gaining carbon into their biomass or releasing it as respiration is the microbiome's carbon use efficiency. So when microbial cells die, when they come to the end of their life, these dead microbial cell materials are still in the soil as necromass, and this can be stabilized onto mineral surfaces. And this represents a really long-term store of locked up carbon. And this is called mineral associated matter. And it's this persistent stable store of carbon that we're aiming to achieve. So we've been sampling soils from 21 sites across the UK, and this work's been led by Ashish Malik. So these sites can be seen on this map taken from Ashish's 2018 paper, and it shows this sort of northeast southwest division of soil pH across the UK. So the red soils in the north are indicating these wet acidic soils, and they're also in Wales. Whereas further south, we have this blue area of more um, near neutral pH soils. So we're looking at kind of very different um, processes here. And at each site, we had a local contrast of land use intensity. Um, and these sites were either directly next to each other, as in the picture, or within a couple of miles of each other. And you can see that to the left on the picture, we've got this long established, botanically diverse grassland. And this re represents low intensity management, compared with arable soils on the right, representing higher land use intensity. So we examined microbial life history traits in this study in terms of how well the microbes were able to grow and incorporate carbon into their cell relative to their loss by respiration. And this is the microbial carbon use efficiency, which we are going to plot on the vertical axis. And we're also looking at how much energy the microbes are investing in resource acquisition. That's looking for food. And this is through um, enzyme production because they need these enzymes to break down um, more complex resources when easily accessible food isn't available. And this tends to happen in resource poor soils. And we're going to push this along um, the horizontal axis. So each point here represents a microbial community response at the sites. And it shows that there's a negative relationship here between having high carbon use efficiency and increased growth or investing in enzyme activities. So this suggests that in these resource poor degraded soils that the growth of the microbes is constrained because they're invested in looking for food and producing these um, enzymes to break down these complex sources. And this leaves a lot less energy available to grow and reproduce. If we now overlay soil carbon content at these sites, you'll see that carbon rich soils uh, associated with these high growth rates and high carbon use efficiency, where the microbes are turning over their populations really quickly. And although there's no legend here, um, the land use intensity um, plot descriptions are given on. So the high carbon soils are associated with these grasslands in the upper left hand side of the, the, the graph whereas um, the low carbon soils are these degraded um, croplands where microbes are investing more in enzyme production to access resources. Um, also in the cropland, you've got much more physical disturbance and this leads to less um, carbon being channeled below ground because the biomass of these communities is much less. So a lot less carbon is being channeled into these mineral associated um, organic matter. So moving on from that study, um, we've been looking at um, a laboratory study 
and this is the results from a recent mesocosm study where we've added isotopically labelled litter to look at the ecosystem response of these microbes. And this is just from one site that we studied previously. This is parsonage down soil. So we're going to look at the fate of the carbon when we add this litter under high and low management intensity. So on the left, we can see the respiration of carbon dioxide, which is the carbon loss from the soil. And the green line represents low land use intensity and the orange is the agricultural or high land use intensity. So you can see there's very little difference between land use um, for the amount of carbon dioxide that's being respired off. Although initially it was higher because we're adding this new resource into the soils. The plus on the right hand side shows the incorporation of carbon from labelled litter into the microbial biomass and we're using um, the amount of label in the DNA as a proxy here for biomass. But you can see for the orange line, which is the increased land use intensity, which represents more stressful conditions for the microbes, there's a lot less incorporation of that label going into the microbial biomass. So this is showing that they've got reduced growth in these systems, and this is reducing their ability to produce necromass, which is this stable um, store of below ground soil organic matter. If we now look at the functional and taxonomic diversity in the same isotope tracer study that we, we talked about in our previous slide, we've got these NMSDS, NMDS plots, and that's representing the beta diversity, which is um, how diverse the compositions are in that community. So the grayed out rectangles on the left of each plot can be ignored, they're for a site that um, we're not going to discuss at the moment. Um, but without going into too much detail, we can see that the separation between the green squares and triangles and the orange squares and triangles. So we've got the green squares and triangles representing communities in the low land use intensity plots and the orange are in the high land use intensity sites. So we see this separation um, across bacterial taxonomic diversity and the eukaryotic diversity, which um, includes the fungi as well as functional diversity, where we've looked at the proteomics um, for these communities. And this means that there are shifts in taxonomy due to the land use intensity within the same soil type. So this leads to a shift in traits, which drives the carbon use efficiency, and therefore the ability of the microbes to channel carbon into this stabilization pathway to be stored below ground. So to summarise, high plant inputs and good soil conditions select for microbes with high carbon use efficiency that are investing in growth, and this leads to higher carbon storage, whereas in arable soils, low, res low resource inputs by crops with small rooting systems, along with tillage disturbance, leads to poor conditions for the microbes to live in, and this selects for a community that can tolerate these stresses and leads to lower carbon storage um, in the soils. It also tends to result in more loss of carbon through respiration as they're having to change their physiology. So because there's been a lot of focus now in agricultural policy on the use of bioinoculants, we set up another laboratory study um, to see if carbon sequestration rates could be improved in arable soil um, if we introduce a, micro, a microbiome from a pristine site. So we revisited two sites from the previous 2018 study that I talked about first, and we've got Witten and Clumps on the left and Napwell on the right. And we collected soils at each site from two land use intensity contrasts. So you can see both sites had a long established botanically diverse grassland and an arable field as a contrast. So in Whittenham, we had broad beans as our arable crop, and in Napwell, we had spring barley planted. And these were collected around this time last year. So we extracted microbes from the soil as a microbial wash, and we also sterilized some of these soils by gamma radiation before re-inoculating with microbes from either pristine grassland or high intensity arable soil into each. Um, of the soils from these sites. So 
So this shows the experiment as it's currently running, lots of bottles of soil set up in an incubator. And um, our reciprocal transplants resulted in four treatment combinations for each site separately. So we have the low intensity soil with its own microbiome added. We have low intensity soil with the microbiome from the arable site, the high intensity. Um, we have agricultural soil, which is high intensity with the low intensity microbiome and the arable high intensity soil with its own microbiome. We've also been adding dissolved organic carbon as a resource for the microbes, as there's no plants in these systems, as you can see. So our hypotheses are that um, either the microbial community is driving carbon use efficiency. So if you take microbes from low intensity grassland soils, so these are resource uptake optimized and they will increase the carbon use efficiency irrespective of the soil type. Or conversely, um, that the carbon use efficiency um, of the microbial community um, is driven by the soil conditions. So if you've got increased resource availability and improved microagricultural structure in low intensity soils, this will represent um, a better habitat for the microbes and select for a microbiome with increased carbon use efficiency in these low intensity grassland soils. Or thirdly, maybe there's like a middle way or an interactive effect where carbon use efficiency is an emergent trait and it's driven directly by the management intensity that causes a change in the taxa and therefore its function uh, and the soil conditions um, changing the taxa, taxonomic recruitment and function of that system. So, um, to date, we've been monitoring carbon dioxide loss from these mesocosms, and we can see that the grey and green lines, um, which represent low intensity soil um, with either microbiome added, tends to have greater respiration than the arable soils. And this is for the Napwell site. Um, initially, you can see that the low land use intensity microbiome increased some respiration from the arable soil, but that this effect didn't persist. Um, similarly, if we look at what happened with soil taken from the Whittenham site, respiration is greater here from the grassland and the arable soil, which again is the green and the grey lines, um, irrespective of whichever micro microbiome that we inoculated. And this probably reflects either increased resource availability um, for decomposition, or it could reflect that we've got more microbial biomass here um, because it's building uh, more growth on these resource rich soils compared to the high intensity arable soil. So um, overall this suggests um, that we've got this sort of soils driving um, the carbon use efficiency response. So it tends to suggest our first hypothesis is correct. So we've been running this study for eight months and we plan to destructively sample the microcosms to answer these burning questions. Um, first of all, have the microbes survived? We're inoculating into sterile soils, so we would expect um, to assemble a community because they're not being outcompeted by native microbes. And we can see this can happen in field trials um, where these bioinoculants have been used in crops, although um, Tom's talk suggests far greater success. So I'm really interested um, to see um, his talk earlier and I'll be talking to him more about that. And we'll also be looking at how the community has assembled over time. So does the community stay similar to what we've initially added or does it shift to look more like the um, original community that was present prior to the soils when we sterilized them? So more like the field um, community that we collected. But our main question is, uh, where's the carbon gone in these systems? Has more ended up in the soil inoculated with microbes from these pristine sites or has more been lost and respired off? So also, if you, I mean, our main focus is that if you introduce a microbial inoculum from um, a low intensity soil from a pristine site and you put that into a degraded soil, can you build more carbon in that soil? So does this low intensity microbiome build more carbon overall? 
So if our hypotheses are correct and um, we're kind of thinking, although we're initially seeing soils driving the response and the respiration, um, we're probably expecting more of an interactive effect. So it could look something like this. So these are our expected results that we might see where the carbons ended up after these eight months of microbiome assembly. So these low intensity soils, which are the green bars, will have more carbon overall because they were carbon rich at the start of the study compared to the arable um, soils, which are the brown bars. But we believe that the carbon use efficiency of the microbiome is the fallout of the microbial community interacting with the soil conditions. And this will depend on the taxonomic structure, which as we saw was different under grassland or arable land use. Um, overall, we can therefore expect to see an interactive effect where carbon use efficiency is an emergent trait and the low management intensity is selecting for microbial taxa with higher carbon use efficiency traits. And this should result in increased channeling of carbon into the soil where we have low intensity soil supporting its original adapted microbiome. In contrast, in the agricultural soils, these high intensity soils um, that are more degraded, we expect to see less carbon being incorporated overall, but we hope to see that inoculation with microbes from a pristine grassland could help build more carbon relative to the microbiome that naturally occurs in these soils that we inoculated. So using this knowledge, how can we better manage our soils? And can we use these microbes from pristine sites to restore degraded sites? Um, Tom's work has indicated that this is a real possibility, but key to applying um, this approach is to um, also address lots of other questions um, when you start to translate these to the field. So um, we understand that when we do these studies in the laboratory, it might not translate um, in the field. Um, we also don't know what the impacts will be on native microbes, and this will depend on where we collect these soil transplants from and the impact of collecting those transplants and taking soils from pristine communities. Um, where should we source these soils? And then how should we yeah. monitor these? I'm going to jump in as chair again now. Apologies. Okay, fine. <laughs> um, but it's so fantastic. And, and partly I'm jumping in because um, some of the questions that you're posing now on your last slide are themes that have been recurring in in the chat box during the presentation as questions from the audience um so i think what what i'll do at, at this point is um welcome back tom as we come to the q a section of the webinar um thank you very much lisa um, and um, we've been monitoring the questions that have been coming up and <clears throat> question directed at Tom but Lisa absolutely um, feel free to, to chip in as well from your experience is um, so this was asked by uh, in various different forms by Cesar, Stephen, um, George Ross it was, it was on my mind as well so for the microbiome biome inoculations um, what do they look like what practical advice would you give are they bulk soil are they selected gills of organisms? Is it leaf litter extracts? Um, you know, what, what should that look like in, in practice? So in, in our experiments, they were just, a, a, I'd say a handful, but like, a, I can't remember how much it was, but a standardized amount, like a soil core from a natural forest, the nearest natural forest, similar to what Lisa was saying, you know, the natural grassland would be the equivalent, you, you know, just sort of the, the, the undisturbed site and we were taking individual like handfuls of soil and when you introduce the plant you you introduce that handful of soil in association with it and the control would literally be just the similar handful of soil from the nearby um from the existing degraded soil uh, which is just the same as, as no treatment it's like the same as a control uh, so what we didn't do is differentiate between the effects of changing the microbial biomass versus the composition or changing the diversity but you know we essentially we just changed everything to make it like a natural soil or like a non-natural soil or like a degraded soil but it'd be there's lots of research questions to say is it the biomass that you're changing or is it the composition that you're changing or the ratio of fungi to bacteria probably all of those things i guess yeah that's fascinating um and a, a related question posed by joe jones that, that i have to ask as well 
Um, it, is it possible? Is it is it desirable to add some um, food for the microbiome for the microbiome as well? You know, should we be adding some um, uh, some prebiotics together with the the microbiome as part of a, a you know a targeted package in, in terms of a, a soil amendment? Very possibly. I'm not sure. I, I I wouldn't be the best to speak on that. Maybe Lisa has a better answer. But but my sort of concept of it, or my understanding of it, is that the, it's the, the plant that's feeding the microbiomes, and we want to just read, sort of use the natural systems as much as we can. And you know, the sort of concept I've got in my mind is that a degraded or or, or a very monoculture agricultural soil will be very depleted in terms of the diversity of microbial species. Uh, and it might be dominated by certain bacterial types that that maybe overwhelm the community. Whereas introducing the the, the diversity and the mixture of, of species will introduce those negative feedback loops that sort of stabilise the community. And you know, there's when you, as Lisa was mentioning, you know, it's the it's the the steps of the microbial sort of food chain as one species dies and then gets decomposed by the next, and then the next dies and that gets decomposed by the next, and ultimately that leads to long-term stable mineral associated carbon storage. But it, I, I believe that that hopefully rebuilding the food web will be everything that we need. But I don't know. Maybe they'll it'd be useful to introduce things as well. Um, we haven't that, that's, that's that great. Thank you, um, Lisa. Did you want to come in there? Um, just that if you're working with cropland species, um, obviously a lot of these microbes and plants are co-adapted, and you're you know if you're trying to establish a crop. Um, and then you're introducing a microbe that isn't co-evolved with that plant, then it's probably a good idea to have the resources in the soil. There might be some sort of lag between, um, you know, the carbon coming in from the plant, the production, and, you know, keeping those microbes alive until they're able to establish. So absolutely um, having some sort of prebiotic um, or, or organic matter um, there as well. Great, thank you. Um, I'm conscious of time. Um, there are a number of questions that we're not going to be able to get to, um, so apologies for that um, in the audience. I am going to ask one final question which I suspect is rhetorical um, for this audience um, from Grant, um, which is, do you think we've underestimated, at least up until this point, the importance of biological indicators of soil health? Oh, that's directed at both of you. I think it's a yes. I think yeah. it's a yeah, absolutely. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Um, th thank you very much. Um, I, I will leave it there with the questions because um, because we are just on an hour now. Um, so on behalf of the British Society of Soil Science, I'd like to express our thanks uh, to Professor Tom Crowther and to Dr. Lisa Cole for coming along to present today. Thank you all for attending this webinar. Uh, you will find a, a quick feedback survey when you leave the webinar, which we hope that you will take the time to complete. The recording of the video will be available after the event on our YouTube channel. And we wanted to bring to your attention um, a couple of events coming up. We have a joint annual conference that we're hosting with the Soil Science Society of Ireland from Monday the 4th to Tuesday the 5th of December in Belfast. It's set to be a really, really good event and registration is officially open via our website with early bird prices available until the 1st of August. Straight after that, we're hosting our early careers conference on Wednesday the 6th to Thursday the 7th of December for our early career members. And registration for that is also open and available through the website. Uh, the next webinar in this series is going to be held on Wednesday the 7th of June and it will be on the peatlands of Wales with presentations from the Welsh Government and Natural Resources Wales. Registration for this has now opened and we will send the link out in our follow-up email. Um, so thank you all for attending today. I hope to see you at future events um, and in the meantime, thanks again and goodbye. <laughs>